Imagine a Netflix of gaming where cloud-native games become the norm. You only stream, not download them. A future marked by interesting alliances, like this one. This is Hideo Kojima, mastermind behind iconic games, and Phil Spencer, CEO of Microsoft Gaming. And when these two met in 2022, it wasn't just for coffee. They announced a partnership for a secret cloud-native game, teased as a never-seen-before concept. An entirely new medium, as Kojima coined it. Meanwhile, Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, its biggest gaming deal yet, almost didn't happen due to, yep, concerns over cloud game monopoly. But with Ubisoft stepping in to share cloud gaming rights, the deal was sealed, and Microsoft's big cloud gaming ambitions stay on track. After that, leaked documents revealed Microsoft's plan of a hybrid cloud console coming in 2028, merging portable gaming with cloud technology. A modest innovation yet another step towards what Microsoft's dubbing as the Netflix of gaming. So, is cloud gaming's biggest moment finally here? After a string of high-profile busts, it seems to be making a huge comeback. But this time is different. But why? And why now? And what exactly is different? And do we even want a Netflix of gaming? Because, like, are we comfortable investing in games we technically don't own? Will we flick through games as we flick through movies, never truly immersing ourselves? It's a lot to unpack. So, I reached out to two specialists. Cloud gaming specialist Daniel Connery. We think hyper-casual gamers are not players of Elden Ring, but they have that instant ubiquitous access that that could completely change. And none other but Steve Cottom, CEO of the world's largest retro game streaming platform, Anstream Arcade. Where the cloud streaming or the pixel streaming uh, will become the, the way we play games. Yep, and with cloud gaming clearly being back on the map of entertainment, let's look at that map and see how the world is gearing up. But first, let's rewind a bit. To understand today, we first need to look at yesterday. And yesterday had a series of missteps. First up on our journey, way back in 2002, Phantom Entertainment stepped out with dreams of a console that streamed games straight from the cloud. Spoiler alert, due to their inability to deliver the promised technology, it vanished like, well, Phantom. Maybe they were just too ahead of its time. And then there was G-Cluster. Ever heard of it? No, you're not alone. It popped up with tech that was kind of sort of cloud gaming before we even had the right clouds. OnLive and Gaikai were up next. It seemed promising, but the lag and the is this all the games we get vibes just didn't cut it. At the verge of bankruptcy, Sony swooped in to snag both OnLive and Gaikai for what would become PlayStation Now. Mid-2010, we see Gamefly, See Now, and Play Giga diving into streaming, only to deliver a blockbuster for games experience that missed gamers' expectations. By 2018, they vanished as well, ending up as a footnote in the What Could Have Been chapter. 2019, and Google jumps in with Stadia, making waves, which then crashed really hard. Stadia had the brand, the buzz, but offered limited game selection collection underwhelming performance and a business model that failed to resonate with its target audience. Also in 2019, and after multiple delays, Microsoft had its cloud gaming attempts with Crackdown 3. It had cloud-powered destruction mechanics, which were supposed to be revolutionary, but just didn't live up to the hype it was marketing. Anyways, these were some of the earlier attempts of cloud gaming, or the dark times as Sony CEO Yoshida coined them because the tech just wasn't ready. But today, almost every major tech company has launched its cloud gaming platform. Microsoft's Xbox Cloud Games, Sony's PlayStation Plus, Amazon's Luna, NVIDIA GeForce Now, Blacknut, Shadow, and Tencent. You see, Big Techs is all in on cloud gaming these days, more than before. So back to the map. The industry is booming, with projections hitting the stratosphere. North America alone could see cloud gaming revenue soar to $6 billion by 2027. That's 76 million cloud gamers, more than the population of UK. Europe's cloud gamers are bound to reach 88 million. That's more than the entire population of Germany. China, India, and South Korea as well are frontrunners, all leaping towards a significant 2027 milestone. So what's up with these mega projections? Why now? I figured four main reasons. A. The tech terrain has evolved. If we go back to the map, I'll show you that the US is set to expand its 5G and fiber network to 7 million new locations, with 5G being 10 times smoother than 4G. And China, with 2 million 5G base stations already, has built another 600,000 in the last three months, as much as we build in two years. 5G and fiber optics are laying the red carpet for cloud gaming's grand entrance. B. We all know instant gratification is the new norm. Consumer demand shouts now. The gaming community is hungry for that play right now experience. And 
and cloud gaming is setting the table. C. Microsoft, Sony and the likes see the writing on the wall and want to reach more gamers. Of the world's 8 billion human beings, over 2 billion are gamers. It's critical for us to deliver on the full promise of over 2 billion people playing video games to reach more and more people. But with the golden ticket of cloud gaming, they will reach these 2 billion gamers. D. Data is the new gold rush. Knowledge is power. Data is power. And cloud gaming is a treasure trove of data, giving companies insights on what players truly want. Simply put, it's now because the stars and the tech are more aligned than before. And with this expansion, it's not just about revenue or massive player counts. It's actually about breaking down barriers. I'm excited about the democratization of video games, the ability for people in all locations to be able to play your game. There is a game called Lies of P. Not that a lot of people would have had a lot of exposure to. Uh, however, they were able to play it on Game Pass and it went on to sell millions of games. Now imagine that model all around the world for any potential player who may want to play your game. Yep, I like that thought. Democratization of games. Lies of P for my mom on the couch, on her phone. Sure, she could stick to mobile games on her phone, but AAA titles at her fingertips where she can seamlessly switch from phone to tablet without the fuss of, uh, you know, downloads and updates. That's a pretty cool idea. But how does this democratization play out technically? Let's explore the mechanics of cloud gaming, which is an offshoot of cloud computing. Here, games run on powerful servers and distant data centers. Instead of downloading a game to your device, you'll be streaming the game from the servers, and they process the game entirely. It's like streaming a movie on Netflix, but for games, also known as pixel streaming, because that's what it does. It streams the pixels just right back to your screen. So when you shoot or dodge, that action is sent to these servers, they compute the outcome in real time and stream the pixels, that visual output, back to your screen. But now imagine if there's a slight delay in the entire process. So lags can sneak in if your connection is not up to par. But again, this is where 5G will shine. But conceivably, when you've got fiber and 5G connections, there's no reason actually you can't deliver there's a low latency uh, through cloud streaming. A good connection is one thing, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. For cloud gaming or again, pixel streaming to be successful, it has to be almost completely perfect across everything from user experience, uh, to latency, to the graphics card that's in the data center. One of the hardest issues is the supply chain of GPUs. Now, even before crypto, even before AI, just think about how much extra time it would take for AWS, GCP, like anybody to order, you know, thousands of the newest GPUs and have them installed on day one to be able to keep up essentially whatever the latest game is. It's never gonna happen because not only do you have to order it, you have to have like a work order for people to install in the data center. So the consumer is always gonna be at least six months ahead, whatever is offered through cloud gaming. And that's a very valid point. Data centers can lack in securing the latest GPUs, but we gamers would also have to constantly chase the latest and greatest news hardware to keep up. Be it PC parts, mid-gen console upgrades, peripherals, or even the latest tablets, keeping up isn't cheap. But luckily not every game requires the latest and greatest hardware. Enter and stream Arcade, the largest retro gaming platform in the world. I mention them because A, they've cleverly combined old school gaming with modern cloud technology, and B, they are the first third-party game streaming service on Xbox. Their service is a reminder that not all gaming experiences demand the latest hardware. I started, you know, playing all my music on Spotify and my movies on Netflix. How do I get all my games I used to love? Gaming's clearly going into streaming. I want to play all these old games, so I put the two together and, and stream was born. <laughs> That's a very powerful pivot. And yet there are common misconceptions around owning your own hardware. There are many gamers that just can't envision abandoning their beloved hardware or gaming rig for cloud gaming. Especially when like the majority thinks that cloud gaming straight up sucks. I think it sucks. And yet, if you think about it, subscribing to a cloud gaming service could actually be the more economical path. Now, what's interesting is what the consumer is prepared to pay for their cloud gaming service. Because what people don't think about, I'll use my son as, a, as, as someone who really is a gamer and, and would spend 10 hours a day if he could every day playing game, burning about 350 watts on his GPU, on his PC, and then CPU, so it's about 650 watt PC. My electricity bills were substantial. And actually, the cost of the electricity for him to play those games was many multiples higher than a cloud game streaming subscription service. So it was actually cheap. Electricity bill. <laughs> Come to think of it, it does make sense to look at gaming as more of a utility. Game as and when you need it. Even in the 1970s, they thought it would be great to have all the processing in one area, and we have a thin client or a dummy client in which we connect to it. The average uh, American, at least, uses 3,000 liters of water per month. And the idea is you would never order that 3,000 liters of water up front and just have it sitting in your living room. That's you know, the why we have utilities with water. Whereas maybe you don't want the tap water, so you're either ordering ahead the, you know, the premium water from like a, a 
Geyser or Springer or what have you. Where the analogy would continue there is the quality of the utility you're getting, whereas everybody would still have access to it. However, some people would be getting not the highest quality, whereas other people are getting the you know, most expensive bottled water that you could potentially money can buy. And I think you're going to see that even with cloud gaming, is you're going to see people who are going to play some games, uh, especially maybe if they're older games, on the other game pass and maybe have some pixel streaming along with it. But when there's the, the newest and latest, greatest Cyberpunk 2077 2, I don't know how they're going to handle that they're probably going to go out if they have the means to get the latest and greatest GPU. So those are people who can essentially afford your premium bottled water. Yeah, and that's what I personally believe it will boil down to. Gaming as a utility. Easy, on demand, accessible, available, anywhere, everywhere, for anybody. But this does not mean it's the end for those who love their beloved gaming hardware. In fact, it actually gives them in others more options, especially those who can't afford gaming hardware and the maintenance of it. So the focus is simply moving from having to have your own hardware to simply having access to an entire system, just like we have access to water and electricity without having to have the entire system sitting at home. You don't own your games anymore, and that's a bad thing. I mean, I get it. Cloud gaming means subscription model means lack of ownership. So there is this perceived threat to traditional game ownership and naturally so some sort of resistance to the idea of not owning your games either physically or digitally. And that's a concern that also goes hand in hand with the idea of cloud gaming platforms taking down games whenever a game isn't profitable enough. I think it's a valid concern. So I asked Steve what he thinks about all this as a ardent retro gamer. And I, I get it. That is a real problem, right? And you see that playing out on Netflix and Amazon as content shifts and moves from, from platforms. So yes, the, the, ultimately, the people that own the IP have control over it. They choose whether they want their games on, on our platform or they don't. But I, I have this deep-seated belief that if you want to preserve something, you have to make it relevant to everybody and accessible to everyone. So I'm a little bit with gamers who worry about not owning your game digitally. It, it's a bit nerve-wracking to think that a game can be taken down when it's not making enough money or when things get caught up in company politics. But on the flip side, there's always a flip side. Not everybody thinks of ownership as something that's defining the game experience. For many, the convenience of access is key. It's, it's the classic vinyl versus Spotify debate. But it's the same for music. If you think about it, there are a lot of people that will say to you, I'm never going to listen to Spotify. I want my my music on vinyl record. I want to put it on a record player and hear the pop of the needle when I drop it. There's a lot of people enjoying their music on Spotify that don't want to go to those lengths for the experience. Okay, but how can we truly trust that these game companies will play fair game with us? Do we now need to rely on them to act in like good faith and not exploit their control over game availability or even political leverage? The way it happens is going to be up to us as a community, players and businesses to kind of uh, and regulatory uh, legislation to kind of figure out how we want to go forward and protect the player while also enabling businesses to to invest and create these new big services with lots of games. Yeah, the dynamics between corporations, consumers and game developers has been a delicate dance, hasn't it? And this dance goes beyond established gaming communities. For emerging markets, where access to the latest gaming hardware is often limited by costs, cloud gaming is a game changer, quite literally. To them, games can be as expensive as paying two, three months of rent. 5G is hard to say because there's different 5G experiences and speeds across different countries. So the 5G in the US is typically not considered uh, as good as maybe 5G in Brazil or uh, Europe. And with this, the real deal lies in hybrid, or even better, cloud-native games. Hybrid cloud gaming involves processing parts of the game locally on your device, with the cloud managing more demanding tasks like AI NPCs, explosion physics, background animations. But the future looks even more cloud-centric with native cloud gaming, where games are exclusively engineered for cloud. In fact, game dev in the cloud for the cloud could be a future coming faster than we think. Cloud-based game devs don't need to optimize games for each and every platform anymore. It means one single game creation stage. It means lower maintenance costs, costs that can be spent on marketing. And with this, game developers will have access to a much larger player base. More cloud, more casual players, more engagement, and more visibility for indie games. Building a game and, and marketing a game is incredibly difficult. You know, there's a reason why such a vast majority of, of games don't make money. And it's not, you know, when we were at the um, Gamescom show this year, we were walking around looking at all the indie games. 
And there were some incredible pieces of content there, absolutely beautiful games. And uh, myself and, and one of the people on the team, we just said, look, isn't it a shame that so many of these games, sadly, won't get the exposure they need to be the hits they deserve to be? And, and that's because they're in a world where you're competing against massive companies that have hundreds of millions of dollars to grab people's attention. So while there are a few bones of contentions around ownership, subscription models, corporate governance, cloud gaming will inevitably allow game devs to tap into an untapped gold mine of dormant and inactive potential gamers who don't even know that they might be gamers. So it democratizes access, lowers barriers to high cost hardware, and even for pro gamers, especially in the esports world. Today, esport gamers all need to have identical top tier hardware. With cloud gaming though, they can engage in crazy matches without having crazy gaming rigs. It will even the playing field with high performance gaming accessible from anywhere. So the real test comes down to performance, of course. You know, these people need to have all the same hardware, all the same rigs. But again, I think cloud gaming could actually level that out. I think it was Nvidia did a test and they got some pro esports players and they put them down in front of a cloud gaming rig versus a, a local rig and they couldn't tell. And what I'm personally really excited about is that that with cloud gaming, I get to just try out and test play games without paying the full price. I can browse and test play games for like 15 minutes or so and see if they really are for me. And I actually think that's a wonderful idea because one, within that 15 minutes, it's, you're less likely to experience any kind of issues with your latency or whatever. You're also uh, not going to be losing too much money from whoever the publisher is because you're only playing 15 minutes at a time. And I, I think it's just a really great idea all the way around. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future too. Yeah, the future. In a way, I really can't wait for all this to become the norm. I mean, options need to remain, whether that's within the subscription model world or access to physical hardware and games. I like options, but I also really like the idea of dropping into an online arcade with the freedom to try out any games I like without having to have a full pocket of coins. Snackable games, instantly, on demand, wherever I am, whenever, for whoever. And that is a change that takes time. But again... Gaming is just a form of entertainment like music, movies and books. And I don't know if I can't speak for everyone else, but personally, I wouldn't want to go back to a day where I had to go to a shop to physically buy a physical item or even order it. Same here, to be honest. It's all about instant gratification, isn't it? <laughs> I want to play it now. I don't want to download. I don't want to wait. I want it now. And speaking of waiting, the secret game that Helio is working on? Well, it's not so secret anymore. Screenshots have leaked and fans are all over overdose. I certainly can't wait to stream that baby on my hybrid console.